Elementary OS Linux on a silent PC, it's Athena Computer's EOS 3 Arsenal Smart Camera Assistant. This time it works, a tool that fixes blurry apps and windows, and more, all coming up on Tech Thing. Thanks to all our patrons at patreon.com slash techthing, you make the show possible. I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm Patrick Norton. And this is Tech Thing, where we have something useful in every single show. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we have a new search engine for open license and Creative Commons. I, actually, so this has been in beta for a while. Um, CC search devcreativecommonsorg Dope. So a lot of people were worried in the wake of uh, all of the changes in licensing and storage at Flickr, whether or not you'd be able to find open source images. I yes. shouldn't say open source. I should say, you know, openly licensed. Yeah, which means you can use them for basically whatever you need. Yeah. And, you know, there's this is not a huge selection of weasel images, but it is an excellent start. Um, well, <laughs> I you love know. that the first one that shows up is an eyeball, well, and the, then the rest thing, are weasels. <laughs> there was one, yeah, and I wonder, like, what terrible thing did they say about these people that <laughs> they're showing up? Or maybe, oh, okay, these are hockey players for the fighting weasels. That makes more sense okay, now. Okay, that makes sense. Um, uh, soccer player weasels issues. Only. So, in, in any case... Um, I, I could find that very useful for like ThreatWire because I use Creative Commons photos Constantly. for all of my thumbnails. So something like that would be great for that. Perfect. You know, it's it's also interesting that it will allow you to search for other things. Uh, but I was supposed to point out, if you're looking on the regular Google search, right, you get a lot more weasels yeah. for your search action. But if you actually want to find stuff you can use, you have to go to tools and usage, usage rights. rights. and. Label for non commutative reuse with modification, for example, if you want to use them. And that gives you a smaller group of weasels, but still a much larger selection of weasels. Right. Yeah, it, it, That's what I usually use for my thumbnails. Yeah. So it, it's something to think about, something available, another tool. But uh, apparently there's also 3D models inside of here and a bunch of other stuff. Wow, so, cool. Uh, Creative Commons, still out there, still doing their thing, except search engines. Yay! Yay. Uh, so speaking of like open things. Open things. We have some open source goodness today, I believe. Let us talk. We review <laughs> a lot of systems from Dell, Nova, and other major manufacturers, but we're always up for seeing what a boutique PC maker is doing. And this, ladies and gentlemen, uh, is Athena Computer's EOS 3. We get excited, right? They reached out to us, asked we'd like to review a silent... It is very quiet. It's silent. Yeah. There's not a fan in this I hear thing. nothing. Yeah. So it, they're running elementary OS on a silent PC. This is the EOS 3. I said, sure. A couple weeks <laughs> later, uh, this aluminum cube showed up, reminding me of nothing so much as a mid-century high-rise or one of the buildings that used to squat near the base of the World Trade Towers, at least how I remember them. Uh, all the cables come out from underneath the case. Cable management is basically through the stand. Inside yes. is the power supply, a Core i3-8100 on a Mini-ITX motherboard, a GTX 1050 GPU, 8 gigs of RAM, and a half a terabyte SSD. Nice. So this is a Streecom DB4 case. It's got heat pipes that route the heat from the CPU and GPU to the sides of the enclosure. So the enclosure itself is actually part of the cooling system. For larger CPUs or GPU cooling, you basically add additional heat pipe kits. The whole thing is 260 by 260 by 270 millimeters, and you can fit up to two 200 millimeter by 110 millimeter cards wow. inside of it. So your 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 GPU selection is going to be somewhat limited. Yeah, uh, but it's nice that you can still fit two. Yes. Well, you can fit like one GPU. Thickness is going to be an issue. Um, but you know, you saw the GTX 1050 inside of there and the cooling inside of the case. This is a $300 case retail without the additional cooling for the GPU. Dang. That kind of adds to the price. That said, like we said before, this is a legitimately silent PC. No sound whatsoever, which is always impressive and makes me happy. Mm -hmm. So the EOS 3 is loaded with elementary OS. It's based on Ubuntu and features the Pentheon desktop environment. It is super clean, as in stripped down. Keeps things really simple for users moving from Windows or OS X. Uh, it's normally offered on a pay-what-you-want model, and uh, there have been issues in the open source community because at one point people are like, elementary OS is trying to trick people into paying for free software. I'm Ubuntu not going to get does into, the same thing. Not going to get into <laughs> that. Well, yeah, who did it first is an interesting question. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, uh, it's got a dock at the bottom, a transparent panel at the top. It bears a strong visual resemblance to OS X, to everyone but the crew that build elementary OS. Uh, <laughs> and i got to say, it's interesting. They remove a lot of preferences and options for some tools, right? Mm -hmm. I remember like the first time I looked at the file manager, it was like, okay, I can't change any things. And simplification, restrictive, yeah. you make the call. Uh, but this is Linux for non-Linux people. And again, I'm not gonna get into the inside baseball Linux geekery or angst over having an operating system that offers curated apps that cost money 
featured prominently. Because quite frankly, I think developers get to eat, or they should be able to eat. Developers should get paid for their work. Your mileage may vary, I understand <laughs> that. So I did a bunch of basic computing, day-to-day -day stuff, and like every Linux distribution I've ever used, there are things that are obvious and things that take some time to figure out. Where I can right-click and do something useful, for example, totally different on an elementary OS compared to Windows. <laughs> Not a big shock that. Elementary, even more so than Ubuntu, is extremely user-friendly and easy to get running. I had to dig well below the curated Office apps to find LibreOffice, for example, but most things just work. There's something to be said for not having all the options in a Linux OS, especially if you're in an environment where you have lots of noobs and you don't want them to click things and go, <gasps> and then you have to do tech support. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Gaming on Linux sucks compared yep. to gaming on Windows. Thank I'm just you. gonna be blunt about that. It is my opinion, it has nothing to do with the hardware on the EOS 3, which is fine for medium 1080p gaming. I am just spoiled as a Windows user, and there's nothing to keep you from dual booting Windows on the EOS 3 for gaming if you would like access to all of the awesome, latest, coolest, bestest games. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> can I get an amen? <laughs> you can get an amen. <laughs> I like this machine. You are going to need to have room for it on your desktop, right? Because the cables come out of the bottom and that is not floor friendly. And you're paying a fairly high price for a Core i3, $1,550. Upgrading to a Core i5, which comes with a minimum of 16 gigabytes of RAM and a one terabyte SSD, will set you back $2,050. Wow. Not cheap, but silent PCs generally aren't. Big loud fans are cheap, which is why most computers make noise. Mm -hmm. AthenaComputer.us is the website for the EOS 3, Elementary.io for the operating system. Go check them out. Y'all, I am so excited <laughs> because I finally, finally, oh, got my arsenal to work so that I can give it a proper review. Now, as you remember from last time, I could not get the device to connect to my camera. And as it turns out, the tutorial that is on their website, on their page, which I showed you last week or two weeks ago, was missing this very crucial step, which was you have to put your camera into aperture priority mode via the little wheel on the top of your camera, because you know you change it from auto to aperture, or shutter speed, or what manual focus, or whatever you want to change it to, you have to put it to the A for aperture priority. Ah. I didn't do that. <laughs> so I was like, oh. So I reached out to their customer service and they finally figured it out what the issue was. Now it's connecting like a charm. I can finally give you a review. Hooray! I would like to point out that Shannon had talked to customer service before doing her review last yes. week. They pointed out that this does not work and does not work for many users. Hopefully. <laughs> the instructions have been altered to reflect this critical step. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. By the time that this episode is posted, I really hope that they include that. They did say put your f camera in aperture priority on the like on the manual for the smartphone app, but that's assuming that you've already gotten into the smartphone app, which you can't do until you can connect the camera to your app. So read unless the you get to that behind point, the locked door after yeah, yeah. And I was yeah. like, I didn't even read those instructions yet because I wasn't in the app yet. So. Aperture priority, that's the thing. <laughs> what does this thing do? Okay, so to recap, uh, this is a smart device that is supposed to intelligently read the data being sent to it through the camera to take perfect photos based on the lighting conditions, the environment, any kind of movement in front of the lens, et cetera, et cetera. It's not waterproof. The battery lasts about five hours, which I was able to test when I was on vacation last week, but it can be charged while it's in use via the micro USB, which you can plug in right on the side, which I I thought was really, really cool. That means that you can do like a really long time lapse and this mm -hmm. thing will last like forever. So I love that that's an included uh, feature. Firmware updates are continuous and that's also a good thing because it still has a few kinks to work out, which I will talk about. In like, for example, focus stacking. That's something that I had mentioned two weeks ago where the arsenal takes multiple photos to get a very sharp focus throughout a wide depth of field. That's still not supported on my A7R2. So unfortunately, it's not something that I can review and tell you about. So hopefully, that's one of those things that they work out and that actually gets updated on my device soon. So I connected to this thing like so. First, you have to take your little Arsenal device and you stick it on the top of your camera. Make sure that it says Arsenal facing you. And then you simply power on the Arsenal and you turn on your camera. You would go for the Sony a7R2. You go into your smart remote control, which is an application that allows you to connect the Sony camera to your phone. Uh, and then you connect it to your phone, which it should automatically do after you've set it up for the first time. Then you open the Arsenal Android app. 
and you click connect when it shows the arsenal on the screen and from there you can start playing with the application to get perfect shots or put it in smart mode to do it all for you. Yay automatic awesomeness in your photography. Except for the parts that don't work yet because they haven't figured out the firmware. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So smart mode requires a tripod and your phone and once you have your shot composed you click on the live view to choose a focus point and then it takes your photo. It does all of the magic for you, like changing the shutter, the aperture, and the ISO, as you can see on my screen that I recorded right on my smartphone here. You end up with a photo kind of like this one that I got at the beach. It looks really pretty. It looks really nice, and it does change the settings too. So for example, when the sun was covered by clouds and I was in shadow, it switched from 1 200th of shutter speed, F14 and ISO 100, to 1 80th shutter speed, F16 and ISO 100. This was likely due to the bright sunlight and the crashing waves in the first photo, which means it had to have that fast shutter speed, to the calmer waves and the clouds in the second photo. So that was pretty cool and definitely intelligent, and I could probably do similar things in auto mode on my camera without the arsenal though, so that, that's a thing. <laughs> now where it shines though in smart mode is its ability to do long exposure stacking where it will take multiple shots and then average those into like all the pixels. It puts them all together into a new photo. A focus stacking where it will make the entire photo sharp even with lots of depth. That's the one that I mentioned earlier that's not currently available for, available for my Sony camera. And exposure bracketing where it will merge multiple photos to create an HDR photo. Now to be completely honest, I'm still learning the concepts behind each of those different ones and how to use these best to get the best shot. Isn't the point of the $300 smart camera assistant <laughs> so that you don't have to learn all of the Yes. Because I mean, because HDR, your phone, your, your Pixel phone, which is not cheap, uh, does HDR photography pretty well. It which does, is basically yeah. It takes like this image and totally. that image, which are completely different and that's another thing, and like smushes the best parts I've, together. I've purchased a bunch of uh, uh, Trey Radcliffe's uh, presets on Lightroom, and I'm able to create HDR photos using his presets on my raw photography straight mm -hmm. from my Sony camera. So if I take that extra step in Lightroom, I can get pretty much the same kind of thing happening there too. So I don't necessarily need the arsenal. Now when I did try it on the beach with mm -hmm. all of these different modes, I was holding the camera. So my photos ended up being blurry because I wasn't aware that I had to use a tripod and I didn't realize that until I read through the tutorial and then I was like, oh, okay, so I'm still kind of learning the process of how you're supposed RTFD to use. For better. Yeah, <laughs> I'm still learning how to use the product itself. But I'm excited to test this again in a setting with water so that I can get one of those really cool like smooth water photos that everybody loves on the internets with like pretty HDR-ness because I know that it works. It's able to take all of those pictures that you want it to the to create like that stacking. The in your house. I know, right? <laughs> yeah, I can do that. <laughs> a smart mode does have a delay whenever you shoot photos for a few seconds. Whoa. So trying to shoot something specific like an animal would be very, very tough. Manual mode allows you to control manual processes straight from your phone and you have to put your camera in manual mode as well on that top little dial for that to work. Uh, luckily that one worked just fine and I had no issues with it, but it's not as exciting as smart mode. Does, I mean, does it make it easier to access the manual settings? Because normally yeah. your phone, right? It's like roll, 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 click, click, roll, click, yes, roll, exactly. click, roll, roll, click, click, and then back, back, back and take a picture. Is yeah. it easier to do it on your phone? It absolutely okay. is. Yeah, once you're connected, all you have to do is go through a little dial and choose Choose your f-stop, choose your shutter speed and your ISO, and then just take the picture, and that's it. So it, it does work. It's very useful. Smart mode, manual mode, and then handheld mode. Handheld mode, yes. That one doesn't require your phone at all. So to do this, all you have to do is hold down for three seconds on the arsenal to put it into handheld mode. It just blinks a couple of times, and that's how you know that it's in handheld mode. And then you just shoot away. So I found handheld mode was much, much faster. Though I did not find the photos to be any more or less exciting than what I usually get in auto mode on my camera itself without the arsenal. So it does optimize the photos after your first test shot. So they recommend taking a test shot, letting it figure out what the environment looks like based on the picture that it just took, and then it will change all those all those settings for the second picture that you take. So even with a faster SD card, you will notice a short delay in write speeds after the photos are taken. Uh, there is no stacking of photos with handheld, of course, because that does require a tripod. Obviously, are not that steady. yeah, we're not that steady. I mean, I tried on the beach; it didn't work, so I can attest to that fact. The time lapse. 
screen is really cool. That one was actually something that I thought I'm definitely going to mm -hmm. use whenever I'm in a place that has like really nice stars or something. So I can get cool star photography of like s watching them go across the world. You know how you get mm -hmm. those really neat time lapses? Oh, yeah. oh my gosh, they're so pretty. But that will automatically calculate the runtime for the photos to be taken and the play time for the final time lapse. It did confuse the heck out of my cat, which was hilarious. Obviously, I did a time lapse of my cat because I thought it was really cute. <laughs> and she was very curious about why this thing in front of her kept on flashing every three seconds or so. But it works. And I love that it shows you on screen, on your phone, the playtime and the runtime for your camera. So you can kind of judge how long it will take before you actually get into this really long time lapse that you're about to create. So that was very useful and very intelligent. Uh, the last thing that that I wanted to test was of course video mode which is the other mode on Arsenal's smartphone app which will allow you to control many functionalities on the video settings via the application but go figure this is not supported on my camera at this time so I cannot test it and that is a huge huge bummer for me because I would love to be able to control video features from my phone via the Arsenal to be able to use this in my studio because I don't have a camera person for my home studio it would be wonderful to stand in front of the camera, set everything on my phone, and then just hit record and let it do its thing. Okay, so it Yay! in some <laughs> cases is in some cases it's not that much better or different, at least yep. from what you're looking at compared to the automatic settings in your camera. Yes. In two of the most important use scenarios for you, they haven't gotten it to work with your camera yet yes. waiting for the firmware update. The focus stacking and the video features. Okay. Man, so for now, it's a fun little device. Like the time lapses mm -hmm. are really cool. The HDR photography is awesome. The smart mode is really interesting, but it doesn't fill all of my needs, nor has it fulfilled all of its promises. When you watch the videos on their channel, they promise a lot of stuff. <sighs> They just haven't gotten there yet. Lots of things still need firmware upgrades to work, but they are also trying to make it compatible with tons of cameras. So I will give them props for working so hard and so diligently to keep on getting these firmware updates out. I hope that they come quickly because I would want to do all of the different features on my uh, or on my camera. It's still new. It's still a very new de device, and as such, you know, it still needs work. So. Would you buy one right now? I don't know if you would want to. I would wait to buy one if you want one until all the functionality works on your camera. And until then, I would just say watch the firmware updates on the website, check to make sure your camera is supported because if it's not, you'll probably be somewhat disappointed like I was. So if it's still under its return window, I will likely be returning it until they get all of those firmware options figured out, video mode being the huge one for me. Yay. Yay. So close. <laughs> I know. So close. so close. My dream is not quite there yet in 2019, but hopefully, hopefully soon it will be. On the upside, did you buy this out of a Kickstarter? Uh, no, I bought it right after the Kickstarter, okay. so I did get like 50 bucks off because they were doing a sale promotion. But unlike two of the last three Kickstarters I did, you actually got a product. I actually got a product, yeah. So yay, the Kickstarter actually worked and they Slash do Indiegogo. have a shipping product, even though the firmware updates are still incoming. So I would love to know if you have any questions about the Arsenal since I have been testing it. I really enjoyed working with it in like that water, kind of in the beach area because that environment was perfect for testing this. Um, so if you have any questions about it, email me ask at techthing.com or you can tweet me at snubs. Battle stations people, Eric's got a battle station he also considers as doing something analog. He writes, after spending too much time at my old corner desk, I decided to create a new space in my office. Taking a little inspiration from vintage aviation, I built the suspended shelves and desk. I need to spend more time organizing, but I have a great place to show off my rise and build, Eric. This is really cool. One, uh, anytime anybody has an airplane propeller in their house, they get really excited. But if the picture viewing app, oh, there we go. You can see where he's actually created suspended shells. Whoa. And oh, look, we got uh, radio controllers. We got a vintage model helicopter. We have something that I can't figure out what it is that looks really cool. There's the propeller, but uh, nicely done. Beautiful. Also, the vintage map, very nice. That's so cool. And of course, if y'all have analog picks or battle stations that you would like to share with us, definitely send them over to ask at techthing.com. We would love to feature them for y'all. Just put do something analog in the subject line so that we see it. Makes them easier to find. 
We love your questions, your tips, and your suggestions of products and ideas to check out. Do us a favor, tweet at TechThing, at Snubs, or at Patrick Norton. We want to hear from you. Or as always, you can email ask at techthing.com. And a big shout out to our patrons, patreon.com slash techthing. You make the show possible. Our thanks to you. Join the crew that makes Tech Thing happen at patreon.com slash techthing. John is having problems with Windows 10 and apps that look blurry. Hmm. Mm. That's a weird thing. No, he writes <laughs> He writes in Windows recommends 100% at the native resolution of 1920 by 1080. This looks amazing and crisp, but everything is so tiny. It's hard to work with it. I have set my scaling to 150% to make it more usable, but this makes some programs look blurry and awful. I tried the <sighs> let Windows fix apps so they aren't blurry setting, but it seems to make no difference at all. Can you help me fix this so that I can enjoy my new monitor and Windows 10? experience from John. Oh boy. How do you fix this, Patrick? Okay, so the 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 TLDR is maybe because oh. some apps aren't optimized to run at higher desktop resolutions and there's only so much you can do in that situation. Um, you've already tried let Windows fix apps and that didn't help. Now you can turn that off for an individual app. If 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 letting Windows help makes things worse, um, right click on the icon, the shortcut for that app, go to properties, compatibility, hit enable display, scaling on high DPI settings and restart your PC, and you'll probably find out that reversing whatever setting that made it blurry will make everything small and impossible to read again. <laughs> It'll be crisp. But yes. small. Okay, snark aside, make sure you have the latest version of Windows 10 on your PC. Creators update, uh, back in, I wanna say, 2017, fixed scaling on a lot of apps. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Uh, if there's a universal, i.e. a store version of the app, uh, get that one because it will scale nicely as that's basically part of what it has to do to be part of the Microsoft Store. Um, you know, I also want to point out, if you look, do a Google search for this, there are a million apps. There is a dedicated page to fix apps that appear blurry in Windows 10. And something else that I hadn't heard of before, uh, try this app, XP Explorer, um, the Windows 10 DPI fix. Uh, it is at the ever so difficult to read Windows 10 DPI fix.xpexplore.com. We'll put a link to the show notes on that one. Um, but it is something worth trying. Uh, they point out at the top that, like, hey, if you're using the latest version of Windows 10 Creators Update, you might not need this DPI fix. But if it doesn't fix your apps, you can try this. Give it a shot. It can't hurt. But the problem is, is that a lot of apps, especially as you get into more obscure apps or apps that don't have a lot of development resources, have never been updated to deal with. Uh, the way Windows handles uh, scaling. Mm -hmm. And that, as you noticed, can be painful on your eyeballs. You could also try scaling to 125% instead of 150% if that is large enough for you to read, uh, but good luck. And it gets worse, by the way, as the resolutions on your monitor get higher. It no. is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Email us, ask at techthing.com, of course, if you have any questions about Windows 10 or other operating systems as well. We love all the questions about all of the different operating systems. Last week, we talked about hot spots for international travel, and I am so glad that we got some responses because, like I mentioned in the show, I haven't actually reviewed these in hand myself. So it's wonderful to see some actual feedback about these devices. So Mike emailed, I have the Skyroam Solus and I am not impressed. First, I have issues with the app syncing with the device. It constantly fails to connect. Second, it did not work well in Germany and did not work at all in Kuwait and Iraq. Third, it failed on me. When I turned it on, the light stays on and is unresponsive, which started happening a few months after I got it. Would not recommend it since it never worked when and where I needed it from Mike. Ow. Ouch. Yes. Thank you so much, Mike, for writing in. That is very good information to know. And then we also got a message from Harry who wrote in about freedompop.com, which I forgot about Freedom Pop. He said, I had a Freedom Pop hotspot. That's so hard to say. 500 megabytes is free on the basic 4G plan. Pro 4G and 3G cost $699 for 500 megs. Premium 4G and 5G give you 2 gigs for $24.99. Additional data can be purchased for $0.02 cents per megabyte for premium plans or $0.2.5 cents per megabyte for the free plan. Oh, Harry, thank you so much. That's mm -hmm. wonderful. Yes, Freedom Pop, they've been around for a long time too. The rule of thumb seems to be that data is really freaking expensive. Yeah. Um, if you're buying it a la carte. It's crazy. It's 2019 companies. And they're gonna make, make every cheaper. penny they can off of our Netflix habits. Yes, they will. <laughs>
A big thanks to Hack5 for the studio space. Check out the security and privacy podcast at hack5.org. Then head over to hack5.org slash gear and check out the Plunder Bug, a pocket-sized LAN tap that lets you bug Ethernet connections with USB-C convenience with cross-platform scripts and an Android root app. This smart network sniffer enables passive recording or active scanning. Thanks, Hack5. And remember, once in a while, put down your phone, step away from the screen, close your laptop, and do something analog, like rebuilding your brakes. Mm. Sounds fun. Which is a wicked ripping pain in the ass of my <laughs> beloved 95 Cummins diesel, because you have to pull off the hubs and fire up the shop press to separate the rotors from the hub so you can put new rotors on. Ooh. Fortunately, the last time I did this, I used all the anti-seize, so everything slid right off. That's good. Yeah, I pulled the boats, everything. Well, no, the the... The previously, despite the fact that the, the truck grew up in Arizona where there is no water, oh, yeah. um, it was still kind of like the mother of all projects to remove this. <laughs> Not like Detroit Salted Road's bad, but Ooh. bad enough. Yeah. Lou Banani sees people, they always make life better. <laughs> Trying to teach the boys that. Antices and lubrication. <laughs> well, Tristan, so Tristan is like the high speed scooter maniac. Oh, yeah. And he blew out one of the bearings Scared. on his scooter. Oh, no. It was crazy. Whoa. I should get a picture of it because it was, it was like, like there were four ball bearings and the retainer was like melted away. Oh, it was glorious. <laughs> we'll talk more. <laughs> my little gearhead. Oh, that's so cute. Oh, my goodness. I'm Battery Norton. I'm Shannon Morris. We'll see you next week on Tech Fest. So did you fix the scooter too? I have to pick up bearings. It's one of my projects today. Oh, okay. I have to go to the skateboard shop, but I want to go to the good skateboard shop because the local skateboard shop is really a bong shop. Well, not really bong. Oh. Apparently kids don't use bongs anymore, but it is an accessory we shop. Used to, we used to have one of those. Oh my gosh, that just brought back a memory of yeah. when I was a teenager and I had to go in a bong shop to buy my Pokemon cards. We probably just violated the G rating on, on It was really weird. I didn't know what they were until I was like maybe a, a senior in high school. And then I was like, I know what those are now. One of my favorite like overheard moments of all time was overhearing a shopkeeper explain to his parents who came in to find out what this thing was in their child's room that they saw through the window in the store. Oh my gosh. It was. Amazing. <laughs> I just sat there with my Diet Coke like, doing good, doing good. <laughs> yep. Mm, yeah.